Okay, great. So next up we have Erica Raznick. She's a biostatistician and epidemiologist at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and she's going to talk about geomarker assessment with R. Take it away, Erica. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so like you said, I work at Cincinnati Children's Hospital uh, with a lot of environmental and community level data um, and the effects of those things on different health outcomes in kids. Um, I work with Colbert Camp, who talked earlier about the computational mobility, um, and some of this talk will be kind of a specific use case of some of his talks, so some of that will kind of come back. Um, let's see if I can, that's a slide, okay. Um, so you might be wondering, what is a geomarker? Um, and so this term kind of comes from another term in precision medicine that you may have heard of, biomarker, um, which is basically anything in the body that can be measured um, and then used to, uh, in, that might influence or predict the incidence or outcome of disease. Um, so similarly, in precision public health, we use the term geomarker, um, which is any objective contextual or geographic measure that, again, influences or predicts the incidence or outcome of disease. So you can see um, in the figure, we have the biomarkers are kind of in this inner ring. They're measured at, um, at a more individual level from that individual's biological makeup. Um, and then the outer ring are the geomarkers that come from the environment around the individual. Um, so this slide just has a few examples of things that we consider geomarkers, um, that could be the deprivation in the community around someone, the crime there, uh, the cultural diversity or isolation. Um, we look at a lot of things with airborne pollution, um, green space, blue space, and gray space, which have a lot to do with how developed the land is um, in that area. Um, there are a lot more here, but uh, other things we've worked with specifically that I've worked with are things like access to healthcare um, and healthy food, things like that. Lots of examples. Um, so we know that geomarkers are powerful predictors of disease disorders, injury, and mortality, um, and we know that they play a role, um, the environment plays a role on health, uh, but the data and tools needed to characterize this at the population level haven't been available until recently. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, kind of like a general overview of how we kind of use geomarkers in typical um, setup. So usually the first step is to geocode, uh, which basically means we're taking a string of text, which is usually someone's address, um, and converting it to coordinates, um, usually a latitude and longitude. And then using that latitude and longitude, we will assign the geomarker, so whichever kind of place-based data we're interested in, um, and this could be based on the exact location at that latitude and longitude. Uh, we could be talking about, you know, kind of an average in a certain buffer radius around that point, um, or even in a containing geometry, like a, these uh, census, tra census tracts a lot, um, or zip code boundaries, things like that. Uh, and then uh, where the modeling would come in, which I'm not going to get into today, but we would use these geomarker um, and determine their association with whatever health outcome we're interested in. Um, so there can be a lot of benefits to looking at geomarkers uh, with health data, but there also come lots of challenges, um, and one big one is reproducibility. So there's actually a lot of geospatial data um, and this kind of data publicly available, um, but it's not always in a universal format that's ready to use. Um, a lot of times you have to have, depending on what the geospatial data, what format it's in, you have to have different um, system dependencies and packages to work with that data. Um, and then something called projection systems always presents a problem. So a projection system is a way to uh, transform the Earth's 3D spherical surface into a 2D flat surface to actually work with it. Um, and so this figure just shows there are lots of different ways to do that. Um, and so the data might be available in different ways. And if I'm working with it in one projection, you're working with it in another, we're gonna get different answers. Um, so that's always a problem. And then the other big problem with health data specifically um, is that is privacy. So patient data, including their address and equivalent, that equivalent geo code um, would be safeguarded under the HIPAA privacy rule. Um, and so this is a problem uh, working with research studies and clinical data, of course. Um, and then I'll also noted here that um, it, there are lots of ways to geo code. There are lots of ways to geo code in R, um, but all the ones in R require you to transmit that address over the internet. Um, and so that would be violating the privacy if we were to do that. Uh, so to try to overcome some of these challenges, uh, we have developed a set of tools. Um, first one I'm going to talk about are these degauss containers, which is the use case of the containers that uh, Cole mentioned earlier in part of his talk. And then uh, we also have some R packages to be used directly in R. So degauss uh, stands for Decentralized Geomarker Assessment for Multi-Site Studies. Um, so this is a novel decentralized 
approach uh, where we can geocode and then also derive some community and individual level characteristics. Um, it's a standalone software based on the containerization. Um, and so this makes it reproducible and standardized. And we never send the PHI to the internet since it's containerized um, and it's executable on the local machine. Uh, it's also doesn't require any knowledge of R or the geospatial data really to be able to use it. Um, and like its acronym, the full <laughs> actual name of DGAUS um, states it was originally developed and is often used for multi-site studies. So there are a lot of problems um, if different sites conduct similar studies and collect similar data and then want to combine that data to look at it all together. Um, there's a lot of legal issues and red tape with, with sharing that data. And so DGAUS is a way to send them the program to analyze it at their individual sites rather than them all sending their data to one site to have it analyzed. Um, so yeah, Cole went over a lot of this earlier, uh, but essentially how DGAUS works is by containerization. So uh, we wrap the whole file system, like he said, everything from the operating system to the R code and everything that would that R code would require to run um, into kind of its own little mini virtual computer. Um, and then we can distribute that. And so this guarantees that the software will always run the same uh, regardless of its environment. And so for so far, most of what we worked with, we use Docker, um, which helps us, you know, manage the evolving software dependencies and versions, um, the code compatibility with changing computing environments. This helps us with a lot of Windows versus Mac issues that kind of removes that whole complication. Um, and like I said, it's easy to use. Um, once the Docker is installed, it's easy to use. You don't have to know how to use R, that kind of thing. Uh, so a little bit about what goes into DGAUS. Um, it's all based on the R script. So this is pretty much a general, any R script you would write to do your analysis. Um, in our case, the code to do whatever geospatial task we're interested in. Um, and then also into the container is the Docker file specifically for Docker. Um, this is the instructions that set up the container, um, kind of the operating system and installs all those, all the geospatial dependencies and things like that we would need. It installs R um, and it installs all the R packages. And then to help with that installing of the R packages and their versions, um, we use the R and B package, which was also mentioned earlier. But uh, yeah, we take a snap, basically a snapshot of all of the packages and their versions that are required to run this R script. Um, and then that goes into the container so that when it's built, um, all those exact packages and those exact versions are installed in the container to avoid future issues. Um, so how this is used by people who actually use DGAUS, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the first step is usually to geocode. So we have a specific container, actually a few of them, but um, that we use to geocode. And so um, if the user has a CSV file with a column called address, uh, they can copy and paste this line of code um, with replacing their file name here into a command prompt or terminal. Um, and the software will parse the address and return a new CSV with the geocoding results. And so that could look something like this, um, where we have the latitude and longitude uh, the, for the corresponding address. Uh, we also often provide the um, tracked census tract identifier because that's used a lot in health data. Um, and then some other of these columns are some diagnostics from the geocoder, how precise that geocode is um, and things like that. Um, okay. And then after that, once you have the geocoded file, you can provide that CSV to another container, um, another copy and pasted line of code um, for whatever geomarker data you're interested in adding. Um, so this example is our roads container, which um, adds the distance to primary and secondary roadways, uh, which is often a surrogate for air pollution from traffic. Um, how close you live is pro probably has to do with how much of the pollution you'd be breathing in. Um, and then it also adds the length of those roadways within a buffer radius around the latitude and longitude. Uh, and then this is just a screenshot from our GitHub page of some other containers that we have um, available. We're usually almost always working on new ones as well. And we have some that aren't here that were like developed for private projects and things like that. But um, so several different geocoders, uh, the roads that I mentioned, uh, we have one for green space. Um, and then this drive time one is uh, for, for certain health centers, including Cincinnati Children's, uh, how far someone lives, how long it would take them to drive to their hospital and things like that. 
Um, so that was all about degauss. So the, in addition to degauss, we've also been developing some specific R packages for certain geomarkers um, to be used in R directly. Uh, these may eventually be developed into degauss containers, but right now they're just R packages, at least for the moment. Um, and we was especially focused on this for the spatio-temporal geomarkers. So I haven't really talked about timing of anything so far. So um, adding the kind of dates that you're interested in, things like that, uh, add a whole layer of complexity to this process. Um, so most of our packages kind of work in the same way, um, just for different geomarkers. And so usually the user would have some data frame uh, with their already geocoded coordinates for latitude and longitude. And then they probably have some date range that they're interested in looking at this geomarker over. Um, and then some of them, certain geomarkers are based on a grid, gridded system. So um, we want to figure out what grid cell that latitude and longitude fall under uh, to match up the geomarkers. Um, so we might add some grid identifier to our data based on the latitude and longitude. Um, and then we would use you know, our main workhorse function of whatever geomarker package this is to essentially the spatial part is gone now and we're just left joining on based on the dates and the grid identifier, whatever geomarker we're interested in. Um, so I'll just quickly go through a few specific geomarkers that we've built packages for. This one's actually not based on the grid system, um, but it's called ECAT. It, ECAT stands for Elemental Carbon Attributable to Traffic. Um, and this one's based on a model that estimates the exposure at the home address uh, based on that exact point latitude and longitude. Um, and then over the provided start date and end dates will um, average exposure at the home address. Um, so this is kind of uh, what it might look like if D was your data frame with your latitude, longitude, start date, and end date, and then you use this add scaled ECAT function, um, you get this new column that would be the average ECAT exposure um, between these dates at this latitude and longitude. And so this only works for our Cincinnati area because that's where the model was developed, so that's all the data we have for that one. Um, we've also worked with the NAR data, uh, which is weather data that's on a 12 by 12 kilometer grid of all of North America. Um, this package actually requires you to download a 20 gigabyte file, so we're kind of working on ways around that, but that's the, st the state that it's in right now, um, and it works in a very similar way. If you look at this bottom table, um, we have the cell identifier for the grid, the dates that you're interested in, and then it's averaging the daily weather values over those dates. Um, this one's air temperature and relative humidity, but there are other variables as well. And then finally, I'll just mention this last one again, that's um, national from the National Land Cover Database. Again, all this is already online. You could download this data and do this manually yourself, but we're just trying to kind of add some helper packages. Um, but this contains different uh, land cover classes, like is the land pasture, forest, developed land, that kind of thing. Um, it's on a 30 by 30 meter grid. And then, uh, like we said, we're trying to work with not having to download a giant file to be able to use this package. So this one actually downloads um, the data in chunks. So only downloading the spatial uh, for the space that you need that you're interested in. Um, and then this one also works for the exact point, the a buffer radius around that point, um, or a polygon. So there are different functions within the package to work in each of those cases. Um, and then this is, again, basically the same thing, latitude, longitude, corresponding grid cell, um, and then added on the data for imperviousness, how developed the land is, this one's forest, etc. cetera. Um, so we have some other things in the works, but this is kind of what we have been working on lately, and that's basically it. So thanks for listening. <laughs> Take any questions. All right, thanks, Erica. Perfect timing there. Uh, plenty of time for questions. And so, yeah, these are great, important, uh, these health analyses and these results. So it's great to see reproducibility and privacy being uh, championed by you and, uh, and Cole and others, uh, University of Cincinnati's, uh, well, not University of Cincinnati Children's Hospital, sorry. Okay, so let me get to the questions. Um, so um, one question was, how well does this package deal with messy address data? Does it perform address standardization? Um, so right now, no. Uh, so the geocoder, um, kind of, it's based on street range files. And so it kind of looks at first the zip code and then inside the zip code, it looks for that street and things like that. So if you don't have your addresses in a great format, um, we tried to kind of, hopefully people can pre-process that as much as possible. Um, it's usually from like random pools from the electronic health record, uh, 
it's like a 95% success rate that it gets like a fairly precise geocode, but there's always some error involved, so. Okay, great. And so I'm going to read out the, the next question here. So with data privacy being a key concern, this seems like a great innovation to deliver value for society. Are there similar outstanding gaps in the art ecosystem? Um, I mean, these types of analyses, like are other things where their privacy is not, not enabled? Just in R in general? Yeah, I, yeah, that's that. I read the whole question, so I'm trying to interpret it, but I think that, yeah, the idea is are there other places and just sort of these sort of health uh, based analyses where there there's work to be done. Um, I'm sure there is. I think that most, most things you would think of doing in general in R um, are probably going to be mostly local, not worried about um, transmitting anything to the internet. Um, but with the geocoding, there definitely is that problem. I know we've, there's um, the drive time thing that I talked about is also implemented in R. You can submit your coordinates to like an API and it will bring back um, the drive time things. But you know, that's transmitting over the internet. So that's why we developed the container around it. So I'm sure there are other places where that's an issue, but I haven't, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so we still have more time. So I'll have, I have some questions, but, but other people feel free to throw questions into the Slido and I'll ask them, I'll try and check back. Um, so what I thought was, have you, do you have examples? Have you convinced other people to collaborate with you because of this, um, you know, that you've gone over these sort of barriers? I know it's really hard. I work in human genetics. So if someone has some data that's access controlled, it can be really difficult. So I assume that have you, been, have you had success, case, uh, success stories where you say, hey, let's collaborate and you don't have to give us any of your data. You just run it on your local and it's all private. Um, yeah, we've done, so we have some people that just will find this, like find our GitHub page and kind of start using these things on their own. Um, and then we've also worked with several different multi-site studies. Um, and sometimes it is kind of hard to convince people, like it just doesn't make sense to most people. <laughs> we don't usually work with a lot of computing people as well, like not a lot of people code. And so um, in the epidemiology kind of space in, at this level, so um, convincing them of exactly what's happening sometimes takes a while, but I think that we have definitely had success and it, I feel like there's a lot more places that this could be used as well. Okay, great. So then my, my final question. So you'd mentioned how trying to get people to install this. So I love Docker uh, and it works pretty well on if you have a Windows Pro or whatever the professional one is, but if you have Windows Home, it's a pain. So if you, if you had people just get hit and throw their hands up and be like, I can't do this because trying to get Docker installed on a regular Windows Home is, uh, is a gnarly process. Yeah, we definitely, this is always the hardest part. We're always like, we promise this is easy. We just have to get through this, <laughs> like this really hard part. And we go back and forth and email a lot. Like we'll have calls sometimes with people just kind of like getting them to share a screen or to tell us what's going on. Um, back before COVID when people were actually at work, um, if they were in a hospital or whatever, a lot of times we get their IT involved just to get that going. Um, we've actually also been working with Jobs and Family Services in Cincinnati. And so, that was a bit of a you know hurdle getting it. I mean, they had you know IT people help them set up a specific computer that would be used for this and all that stuff. So um, yeah, that's definitely always the hardest part. But I think the payoff is worth it. In the right, end, right. Yeah, you know? you're doing good work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're doing it. I promise this is easy <laughs> eventually. <laughs> okay, great. Um, all right. Oh, there's another. Okay, so we'll do the final. This is a short one. So the person okay. asks. Sorry to be dense, but does this mean I could use Degas rather than Google to geocode locations? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have, it's actually, you can actually go to degas.org um, and there's a lot of documentation there about how to get Docker installed um, and then how to use it to geocode once you have it installed. So yes, it's open, freely available, um, and uh, documented as well as we possibly can. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, let's end questions there. Thanks so much, Erica, for a great presentation.